today I want to talk to you about the strong tower of the Lord. That God wants us to feel and be safe. He wants us in His safety. The Word of God is chock full of the protection of the Lord. He, he came to Abraham. He said, Abraham, don't be afraid. I am your shield. He wants us to know that we're safe. He doesn't want us in fear. He doesn't want us having faith in some intangible future that's going to harm us, but he wants us to have faith in the safety that he's prepared for us. Right? He's a refuge. God is a strong tower. He's a mighty fortress. He's a secret place. He is my hiding place. He's my covering. I can find refuge under his wings. His truth is my shield and my buckler. He is my sanctuary. He's the place I can run. He wants us to feel safe. It says in the book of Proverbs that the fear of a man can bring a snare. But those who trust in the Lord will be safe. God doesn't bring the snare, but our fears can make life harder than it's supposed to be. God didn't do it. And so he wants us to stay out of that fear and stay in his safe place to the Israelites, when they left Egypt, he was a canopy of protection. He was a cloud by day and a fire by night. When God says, I am your shield, I just want you to picture he's not some little shield that you're holding, the shield of faith. He is enveloping you. God is big. He is creator of the heavens and the earth. He's the Alpha and Omega. And if he says your shield, it's like Kirk saying, Dr. Sulu, shields up. I don't know, is it even a doctor? Shields up, Star Trek shields. Like you're safe on the ship that is God. He wants you to know that you're protected. He doesn't want you to be in fear. Today, I want us to remember that when the Israelites were protected, that there was none sick among them. And my desire and prayer, my wife and I, we pray, is that we would see that kind of promise true in our church, that those who are in this family, that there'd be none sick among us, that we'd all be underneath that canopy. It says in Isaiah chapter 4 that those who remain on the mountain, who remain, and not everybody remains, but those who remain on the mountain, I will be a canopy for them, a cloud by day, and fire at night. He is protecting us on every side, making sure that every need is met according to his riches and glory that there'd be none sick among us. I want that bubble. It's like a bubble. Because the reality is, is that we need a safe place. It's, I mean, it doesn't always feel safe in this world. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? We've got terrorism. There's, North Korea's gone nuclear. My son Matthew's about to drive. <laughs> We've got kids in football sometimes. So we don't, do we always feel safe? He wants us to feel safe. He wants us to feel safe in our homes, but some people don't even feel safe in their homes. He wants us to feel safe in our neighborhoods. He wants us to know that we're safe in our cars when we're driving. The other day we were driving. My son brought us, to, been teaching him how to drive. And so he, he reminded me of this story. He remember that time. He told me the story from his perspective, and I'd never heard it from his perspective. So I want to tell it to you. And we were driving down from Snowball. We'd been skiing all day, me and the whole family, and we were loaded up in the car, and it was icy roads. It was particularly cold that day. It was the afternoon, and the roads were pretty icy. And we came kind of across and down, and we went down the... You couldn't see what was coming because you were going kind of flat, and then suddenly it kind of dropped a little bit. You couldn't... But when we dropped, we saw at the end of this drop where it turned left, a car had slidden off the road which they do sometimes. People drive too fast around ski resorts. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? And uh, they, slid right, they had slid right into the, the snow, but there was no guardrail on this corner. And it had slid so far, as I pulled up and I stopped, there was a woman outside the car and she was kind of frantic. And uh, so we pulled up behind, pulled off the road a little bit, but she had slid so far into the snow that her car was only a few feet from going off the cliff. And she was very, you know, frantic. She, her kids were in the car in car seats, and she didn't want to climb in and have it kind of whatever might happen, and so can you help me? So I, I got out of the car, and I got her kids out of the car, handed her her kids, and I, told, I said to my boys, can you come here out of the car? We're gonna, I need you to push while I drive. Just give me your car keys. 
So I got in the car. Well, while all this is happening, other cars are coming. And as they're coming down this thing, they're seeing us at the bottom, and some of them are not reacting properly. So one car slides a little bit off the side of the road and, and slides behind where my car pulled off, slid off a little bit into the snow, but not in a dangerous way. Then another car started to slide and slid in front of where I was in her car getting ready to pull it forward. They slid in front of me off the road a little bit, so now I was gonna have to kind of drive around that car. My boys are pushing me, and we're starting to itch forward. It's a little stick shift, and I was getting it going. And then another car came flying over the hill, and they panicked, and they slid and hit the car, not too hard, but it was definitely a loud noise, hit the car that was behind me, and stopped. Now, they weren't in a dangerous spot either. We're the only ones kind of near the cliff. And then another car went into a flat spin on the ice. It was just woo, woo, woo. And it slid into the car in front of me where I was trying to get around them. And so I got around, and my son said to me, Dad, I was freaking out. And I, I remember it differently. I was like, yeah, there was a lot of cars hitting each other, wasn't there? <laughs> but I simply said to the woman, I said, get in the car, put your kids in the car. And I looked at my wife, and, and she, she, I said, get in the driver's seat. And I just kind of pointed, driver's seat, we're going down the mountain. She said, okay. So she hops out of the car. She gets in the driver's seat of my car. I'm in the, and I, I decided to drive this lady and her kids down the rest of the mountain safely. And so we're driving down the mountain. Other cars are all around us wrecked. <laughs> and I thought to myself, though a thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you. I want that kind of bubble of protection around your life. Somebody say amen. amen. So I want to go to this scripture. It's in the book of Proverbs. This is where we'll be today. Chapter 18 and verse 10. It says, the name of the Lord, say Jesus. Jesus. That's the name. The name that's been given is the name that is above every name. The name of the Lord, Jesus, Yeshua, is a strong tower. It's a place. The name to God is a lot more than we might think of a name, but the name to God, it's a place you can go. In fact, in the Old Testament, God would choose a dwelling place for His name, in the same way that he would call it a dwelling for his spirit, he would say, it's, it's where my name dwells. So kind of getting this definition of how God talks about a name, it's a dwelling place for his name. He would say that the tabernacle was the dwelling place for his name. Deuteronomy chapter 14 talks about the dwelling place of the name, but it's in many places. Now, Jesus resides in you. Somebody say amen. amen. But Jesus also resides in his spirit. The spirit of the Lord resides in our gathering. Ephesians chapter 2 and 3 talks about when we gather, that the spirit of the Lord is, being, is, is dwelling in what he's building up together in us. So, so he's in you, which means his name dwells in you, and he's in us, or we're in him, I guess you could say better. When we come together, we're in him. He's in you, and we're in him. When we gather, we're, so there's two. And so his name is in you, it dwells in you, and he has given you access to infinite power by his name. He says, ask for anything in my name, and it will be done for you. There is a massive amount of authority and power. When Peter here healed the crippled man, the beggar that was at the gate called Beautiful, he said it was faith in the name that healed this man. Lord Jesus, did you get that? There's power in the name of Jesus. So his name is a place, and it's, it's a strong tower. Now listen, he says the righteous will run to it and be Safe. He wants you safe. Now, the word safe is the Hebrew word sagav. Remember this. You are the righteous. You are, say, I am the righteous. Am the we are the righteous. Because you, you believe in Jesus, that makes you the righteousness of God. It's not your own righteousness, but it's God's righteousness that is on you and in you because of your faith in Jesus. And he says, the righteous will run to it and be safe. The Hebrew word sagav for safe is also throughout the Hebrew Bible, uh, it translated as high. Because if you look at the definition of sagav, it means a safe and inaccessibly high place. 
It's a high place. So the word safe doesn't, we might miss it, but it's true. he wants you to know that when you run to the strong tower, it's a high place. In fact, it's so high that it is inaccessible. It cannot be touched. It cannot be attacked. Come on, somebody. You are in a safe place. So I'm going to tell you a story now. A couple of them. I'm going to talk about this first one. It's a story found in Judges chapter 9, and it's about two different places of safety. One of them worked, and the other did not. And so we want to see the contrast here, because God, in His wisdom, He gives us these stories in the Old Testament, so that we can see kind of metaphors, what's applying to us today. So I love getting into the Old Testament, find a story, and God says, yes, this is what I'm talking about here, and that applies to you now. And so here's this story. In Judges chapter 9, there's a guy named Abimelech, and I, I talked a little bit about this about three weeks ago, but it was a different, we were talking about a different point. So we're squeezing a little more revelation out of the same story. In Judges chapter nine, it says that Abimelech, this guy, he's the bad guy, he's like the devil in the story, and he's going around attacking cities. So he attacks this one city, it's called Shechem. He goes there and it says, the people of Shechem retreated and ran to a place of refuge. They took safety or held up in a temple of a false god. Well, in fact, let's read it in the scripture of where they hid. Judges chapter 9 and verse 46. Now when all the men of the tower of Shechem, this is not the strong tower, is it? But it's the tower of Shechem. The word Shechem, when you see Shechem, and when I teach you about Hebrew words, we, we, we have to remember, whenever you see Shechem in the Old Testament, it is a picture of the law, it is a picture of your works. The idea that you can be good enough to be blessed by God, the idea that, that when you're bad, he's going to punish you with something terrible. Okay, Jesus took away that old covenant and made it so that by faith we have God's blessing, His righteousness, His authority, His inheritance, the promises of God, somebody, the authority that we're heir of the world. These are all things that are gifts from God now, not by our works. So when I see Shechem, it actually, the word actually means a laborious labor that brings weariness. It is the back and the shoulders of heavy burden. And Paul talked about it as a yoke that the Hebrew people could not bear. It was a heavy yoke upon the shoulder. So that's Shechem. The people in Shechem, it says that they entered the stronghold, they thought it was strong, of the temple of the God of Berit, which means covenant. So they went to a covenant of the law or a covenant of works to take up shelter and find safety. It was a false God. Abimelech, the bad guy, puts some wood up by the temple. He lights it on fire. Boom, everybody dies. Okay, not a safe place. They were held up in a place that was not safe. Sometimes when the enemy comes at you like in a flood, like a flood, you may run to the wrong place of safety. People might run to the wrong kind of things. They might run to the wisdom of the world. They might run to the bar. They might run back to that old addiction. They might run to some old friends. They might run to what the world says. They might run to some false things that don't work in their lives. And they find that that enemy, when they bring destruction, that there is no safety in the places of this world that might look like a strong tower, that might sound like a strong tower, but it will burn and it will crumble. So here's this, uh, now just one verse later, Abimelech attacks another town. And he goes to this city, and it's called the city of Zathar, and, and the city of Zathar means gathering of light. And so it's a picture of the church because we're a city on a hill, and we let our light shine, and Jesus talked about that. So again, a metaphor of the gathering place, the city of light, the gathering of the light. But there was a strong tower, say strong tower. So Abimelech attacks Zathar, and the people of Zathar, the city of light, had a strong tower in the city, praise God. And all the men and women, all the people of the city fled there, shut themselves up in. Then they went up to the top of the tower. They went to the inaccessibly high place of the strong tower. So when we think of strong tower, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. Now, Abimelech does what he's like, I've already done this. It's not my first rodeo, whatever. I just put some wood around it. We'll burn it. We already went. We, we know how to do this. He put some wood around it. Well, in the meantime, a certain woman, we don't know her name, she grabs a millstone, an upper millstone, and she lobs it from the tower, and it hits the guy, the bad guy, the devil, whatever, Abimelech, right in the head and crushes his head. Woo! <laughs> Praise God, the enemy was defeated. It crushed his head, and then he was dying, so he told some guy, he's like, can you sword me so that people don't know that I was killed by a woman? So the guy sorted him. But guess what, Abimelech? We still know. <laughs> Didn't work. So she and the whole city was saved, 
because they ran to the strong tower. Now let's identify, we'll go back to the other tower, the temple real quick that didn't work, the temple of the false. And the idea that it was in Shechem or the temple of their works. And so this is what people do a lot, even Christians, when they're under attack. Pastor, I'm under attack, man. The washing machine broke, I got a flat tire, kids are sick. Man, the enemy's just coming at me like a flood. Okay, so what people do sometimes when the enemy comes at them and attacks them is they go to their temple of works, the temple of their labor. And they say, and we've, you've said this, and I've said it, we've all said it. What have I done that would warrant this kind of attack? Or, I know what I did and I have this coming. In both cases, it's the temple of did I deserve it or didn't I deserve it. I'm trying to play the game of deserving. That's an old way of thinking. It's a failed strategy. Okay? It's because no, no time did Jesus ever come to a leper and say, I'm going to heal you. Well, I can't because you haven't lived your life well. You made some mistakes today. You had some dirty thoughts this morning. I can't heal you, leper. No, no time did ever Jesus go and heal a crippled man and say, I'm sorry, but God's still punishing you because you still have some sin in your life. He's still working it out. It never happened. It was a gift. It didn't matter what their life had been like, but Jesus just healed them because it's a gift. Somebody say amen. But when you're at the temple of your works, it's failure. It doesn't work. Right? And so we do this in our lives. We, see, now, if you get pulled over by the police to get a speeding ticket and you were speeding, just so you know, you did deserve that. <laughs> okay, if you're mean to your wife, she'll be long enough, she'll start being mean to you and you'll make a mess of your marriage. You did it. Okay, so do, I'm not talking about that kind of stuff. You got the ticket, you got the, but God didn't give you the ticket and God didn't make you have a bad marriage. You were, you did that one all without his help. I got like four people clapping their hands. You could repent while the cop's walking up to your door. You'd be like, Lord Jesus, forgive me. And he'll forgive you, but you're still going to get a ticket. But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the flat tire and the washing machine broke and the fridge broke and then, or the doctor gave you a bad report. And, and so you're like, I'm under attack, pastor. What do I do? He's coming at me. His enemy's coming at me from all sides. He's coming in like a flood. What do I do? I didn't deserve this. Or I know I did deserve it. I'm getting what I paid. I'm getting what's coming to me, pastor. That's the temple of your works. It doesn't work. You got to go to the strong tower with the name of Jesus. It's not about what you did or what you didn't do. It's about what Jesus did and he did it all. And you just believe in the name. The name of the Lord is your strong tower. Not what you did. Your, what you did is not your strong tower. What you didn't do is not your strong tower. You just run to Jesus. Jesus! There was this, the, a lady. I talked to this guy. He's in the hospital. I was praying for him. He had been attacked by a bull. He goes to our church. Wonderful man. Strong. He's so strong. He's like a cowboy. He works with horses his whole life and bulls. I'm, I bet the bull is hurting too. I bet the bull is actually damaged. He got attacked. He dropped down in a trailer with a bull and he was closing the door and the bull just got mad and started attacking him. It wasn't even his bull. It was like his neighbor's bull. But the bull is just pounding him into, and he, he's, you could die from this, obviously. So the bull is just pounding, won't let him up. Won't let him up. For, just will not stop. Just keeps pounding him and pounding. So the wife is there. She feels so helpless and she's, she was actually up above the trailer. She could see what was happening and she, 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 didn't, she felt helpless. But then she said, stop in the name of Jesus. Yeah. Boom, the bull stopped. They looked up at her, and they pulled him out. And he's got some broken stuff, but he's all fine. He, he's going to fully recover. Somebody say amen. Dude's tough, man. Why? Because she turned to the name of Jesus. Now, this woman, she grabbed this millstone. Now, what is she doing with a millstone in a strong tower? I don't know. But the millstone represents the rock that is Jesus Christ. Okay? He is the, Jesus is the rock of our salvation. And he's the incorruptible seed, right? She's, this is the seed of God. She picks up the word of God, this millstone. It's the name of Jesus. And she walks over. I don't know if she was grumpy that day. You know, maybe when she got attacked in the city and she was like, she's already working with the millstone. She's probably right there. She's probably scrubbing. Because you would grind grain with the millstone into flour. So she's probably grinding grain. And maybe she's, she's just like, man, today. And she hears this noise out in the city, like, run to the tower. She's like, seriously? One more thing today? Are you kidding me? you got to be kidding me this is happening today. We're, I wake up, we're out of goat milk. The whole house smells like camels. 
So she's like, I'm up. So she took a weapon with her. You gotta take a weapon with you, right? She gets the weapon. And, she, and th these things were pretty big and heavy. And so she carried this thing all the way up to the top of the tower. Maybe the men are up in the tower and like, what do we do? I don't know what we're gonna do. And this woman's like, oh. you know what? I got this. She picks up the big rock. She walks over to the window and she's like, what? what? She's, what's she doing? She's quoting the word of God. She's dropping it like it's hot, too. She's dropping that name of Jesus. Rapunzel about to make it rain, yo. She's like, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Done. All right, let's go. And her faith in the word of God saved the whole town. She was up in this high tower. You know, I, I, I was talking to a, a, a lady um, years ago. She went to our church. She moved away some years ago. But uh, she was at the Twin Towers when they were hit by the plane. She worked in the building. And she lived in New York City. And then she, they were hit on 9-11. And, and uh, they said she, 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 they didn't tell people what was going on if you were in there. And you can read up on the history on this. And so everything I'm going to say, you're gonna, it's gonna, some of it's going to freak you out a little bit. But they, they made an announcement. They said, you, everyone should leave the building go down the stairs. So she's walking. Don't use the elevator, they said. So she's walking down the stairs, many, many, many flights of stairs. And all the workers are walking down. And they don't know what's going on. Nobody said, hey, the building got hit by a plane or something. And so they're just walking down, walking down. And then somebody came up. This is a true story. Somebody came back on the intercom to the whole building and said, return to your seats, return to your desks. Everything's fine. That really happened. And so she's walking down these steps. And she said to me, I said to Jesus, what do I do? And she said, I heard a small voice inside of me that said, keep going. Just keep going. So she said she fought. Everybody else is walking back up. She walked down. She kept walking down. She got outside of the building. She walked down the street, and she was saved from that tragedy that happened. How many know that sometimes if you just listen to the voice, God is your shield, and you turn to the name of Jesus. Jesus, what do I do here? And he'll tell you, don't turn left. Go straight. He'll tell you, don't leave the house yet. He knows where every drunk driver on the road is. He knows where every terrorist is. He knows where every attack of the enemy is. He knows when it's coming, and he says, I want to be your shield and your protection. Will you listen to me? Maybe the angels hid your car keys so you wouldn't leave on time. Somebody say amen. amen. Praise God, you stay in the bubble of protection. Lord Jesus, that's a good word. You know that the high tower is inaccessibly high. It's inaccessibly high. When you're up in the tower, you can see what the enemy's doing. I imagine the woman would look out the window and she saw, well, there they are. That's an easy target. But you know, the enemy couldn't see them, couldn't see what they were doing, couldn't hear what they were saying. God, when he says to you, you're a strong tower, he wants you to know something. And this might freak you out a little bit. This might change your thinking. It changed mine. But he talks about being a hedge of protection around you. A strong, you know that you can't see through the hedge. When you're in a strong tower, you know that the enemy cannot even see you, cannot even hear what you're saying. When you're underneath the canopy, the enemy has no access to what you're saying, can't see. See, when I was a kid, I was taught there's demons everywhere, right? And they're just coming out of the speakers when I listen to that secular satanic music. It's coming out backwards. How many remember that? The Satan coming out backwards through the, and he, he's just all around. I go to sleep at night. I was just like, he's all around me. Satan's all around me. He's just, he's just watching me sleep. No, he can't see you. He can't come near you or yours. He doesn't know what you're doing. He doesn't know what you're talking about. When you're in the bubble and the shield, he has no access. You, you think he had access to Moses, he'd have killed him. Daniel, Elijah, Elisha, God was protecting, protecting Abraham. You think Satan wanted Abraham to live a long life? You think the kingdom of darkness was okay with Isaac living or Jacob living or the Joseph? Come on, somebody. These great men and women of God live long lives. God is your shield. He is your protector. And Jesus would say, he went up on, on the mountain, the uh, Mountain of Transfiguration. It says that he took just Peter, James, and John with him, and he had a top secret meeting. On, he was glorified. How many remember this story? And Moses and Elijah showed up. And it says in the Bible that Jesus turned bright as light and uh, bright white, his clothes and everything. He began to glow. And it says that they began to speak 
of what was going to happen regarding the crucifixion. What is this? This is a top secret meeting. When you have a top secret meeting, where do you go? You go up to the high place. Praise God. He went up to a high place on the mountain. Satan did not get to hear that meeting. He was not even close. He couldn't speak in. He couldn't listen to. He had no access to. They were inaccessible. If you were near Jesus, Satan could not be near you. Somebody say amen. Even the demons had to flee. Praise God. And so they had this top secret meeting of how it was going to go down. He didn't want Satan to know that, yeah, I'm going to die, but then I'm going to resurrect. He didn't want Satan to know that. He got to, he's like, we got to get Satan to kill me. This is going to be great. It's going to be the best Trojan horse ever. I'm going to go down to hell and set the captives free. This is going to be great. I'm going to get the kingdom of God. I'm going to get the keys. Shh, don't tell Satan what I'm about to do. He didn't know. And so he told Peter, James, and John, don't say a word about anything you said, what you saw or what you heard to anyone when you leave this mountain. Why? Because they might tell somebody that's not under the canopy. They might tell somebody the plan that's not underneath it. Right? It was a top secret meeting. You've got to delete all the emails as quick as you can because... <laughs> and I'm not being political. I'll never do that. I'll never. I really am not. I'm just making, it's funny out there right now how they attack both candidates. And I said to you guys last week, you would think that the Prince of Darkness was running against Beelzebub. Just, just you know, the media just kind of takes everybody and makes them look worse than they are. Amen? Amen. Is that true? Yeah. All right. So you know how the, you know if the media is not being truthful with you? They're talking. Okay. <laughs> He's got a little media joke there. Praise God. And so... There's another story where, where David, he's, he's not king yet, and uh, things are good for him. Everything's been going really well for him in his life, in this part of his life. But he's, he's just now finding out that Saul's going to kill him. Saul's going to want to kill him. He's, he's been anointed to be king. Now he's de defeated Goliath. Now he's married the king's daughter, Michal. He's living in the palace. He's a musician for the king. He's one of the king's top generals. He's sitting at the palace. He's eating the promises. He's got the protection. He's got the position, right, in line for the throne, being a prince married to the king's daughter. It seems like everything's just going good, boy. Life is good. He's got a paycheck. Everything's great. God has raised me up. But he's about to find out whether Saul wants to kill him or not. Saul's the king, and it's his father-in-law. And so... They set up like a little code. Jonathan was, Jonathan was Saul's son, who's David's best friend, and he went to go find out if Saul wanted to kill David or not. And they set up a little messaging system. He's like, I'm going to shoot some... David, sit here by this rock for three days. At the end of three days, I'm going to shoot some arrows, and this will be our little messaging system. You're going to see some arrows fly. When you see the arrows fly, you know the message is coming on whether my dad wants to kill you or that you're okay and you're restored and everything. Just come home. He's waiting for the news to see whether his life is either looking like it's destroyed or whether his life is looking like it's restored. That's the news he's waiting for. He's looking for, am I about to lose my wife? Am I about to lose my position? Am I about to lose the palace? Am I about to lose my promises? Am I about to lose my protection? Am I about to lose my paycheck? I'm going to lose my friends, my family, my best friend. I'm going to have to run. I can't go home because they're going to look for me with where, where my dad is. I'm going to be on my own. I'm going to lose everything. Or I'm going to get restored. That's what he's waiting by the rock to hear, for the arrows to fly in. Well, sure enough, the arrows come and they say, man, you better run. My dad's going to try and kill you. David wept bitterly. It says he wept bitterly. Maybe he felt like his destiny had been destroyed. It looked like I was about to become king, but now it's been all taken from me. That's what it looked like. It says that he ran to Nob. He fled to Nob to the gathering of the priests. He went to God's house. The first place he thought to go was the strong tower. You see, it was David who wrote the, the book and saw most of the Psalms, and he wrote chapter 91, a chapter of God's protection in our lives. Right? He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High will abide. So he ran to the secret place, God's house. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. He ran to the Tower of Refuge with the priests there. And he said, you know that we're the royal priesthood? Did you know that this gathering is a royal priesthood? 
and that people in this world need a place they can run to when they feel like their destiny's been destroyed, when they feel like their family's falling apart, when they feel like everything's falling apart, when that addiction's taking them to the bottom. They need to be able to walk in these doors and see a royal priesthood. And the priest gave them five loaves of bread. Five is the number of grace. We extend grace, but they gave him bread for his weariness. You come to God's house when you're weary and you're burdened and you're tired and you're being attacked and God says, here's five loaves of bread for your weariness. Let me recharge you. And then he got a sword there while he was there. Goliath's sword was hidden there. How many know that when you go to the strong tower, it's not a position of weakness, but it's a position of strength. And he gives you a sword so that you can win. He gives you a millstone. You come to God's house and the word of God comes and says that you can. The world told you you can't, but you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. That God is the God of the impossible. Have faith in God. Come on, somebody. And you get that millstone and you just lob it out the window. Boom. Praise God. Woo. Glory. As he was sitting and waiting for those arrows to come, the arrow would bring him news. The arrow was going to bring him news. Does it look like everything just got worse? Or does it look like everything's about to get better? And sometimes the, the company says, hey, we're going to have some layoffs. And you're about to find out about your department. And you wonder about the news. And you dread the moment the news comes. Will it be good or bad? You took a test. And the doctor's about to give you the results of the test. It's coming in a couple days. And you dread the news coming. You dread that arrow that will be flying through the air that will say, yes, the test was bad or the test was good. And so when David wrote in Psalms chapter 91, he wrote this, he said, I will not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day. What was he saying? He was saying, it doesn't matter what the news is, I'm gonna trust God anyways. It doesn't matter what the doctor might say. He might say things are looking bad, but I know even if the doctor gave me a bad news, that my, I know that things are looking good. We used to wait for Logan, to, to, he, when he was born, they said he was gonna be sickly. But we would wait for these tests to come. But I did not rely upon the test to determine my faith. And the test would come back and say, yeah, he's still sick. But I didn't believe it for a second. I knew that things were coming back. And David stayed in faith. He was not afraid of the arrow or the news. And when it said, your destiny is destroyed, David didn't buy it for a second. He knew he would still be king, that God would still find a way to raise him up. And even in the bad news, God could still be Lord of your life. Even in the bad news, God could still be the strong tower. Come on. And so he writes this. Can I declare something over you today? He writes this. David writes this. Can I declare this over you today? Do you mind if I declare some protection in your lives? From the church, the woman, the bride of Christ, right, who would crush the head of the serpent with the seed of God. Can I be that for you in, the, in just this moment? Can the church give you a millstone for a moment? Can I do that? He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide in the shadow of the Almighty. And I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him will I trust. Surely He will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and the perilous pestilence. Praise God. He will cover you with His feathers. And under His wing you will take refuge. His truth will be your shield and your buckler. You will not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in the darkness. Praise God, nor will you be afraid of the destruction that lays waste. Though a thousand fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, though it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes will you look and see the reward of the wicked, because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your home. He gives his angels charge over you. They will keep you in your ways. Praise God. They will keep you in your ways because you have made the Lord your dwelling place. 
God wants to be that most high place for us. Praise God. How many are ready to be under the canopy of the Lord? How many are ready to make the Lord their refuge? May God come be that for us, that canopy. Boy, the Spirit of the Lord is on me so heavy right now. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father God. Praise the Lord. Lord, I just thank you and praise you for this time. I ask, Lord, that you'd bless this in Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus, Lord. And we have set our love upon you. And you will deliver us. And you will set us on high because we have known your name. Thank you, Lord. And we will call upon that name, Jesus. And you will hear us and you will be with us in times of trouble. And you will deliver us and you will honor us. And with long life, you will satisfy us. And you will show us your salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. Give the Lord a hand clap. Any good? Praise God. If you're here today, you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I just want to pray with you, and I want this to be the part of the service where you give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're ready to make that kind of decision, let's make that decision together, shall we? I'm going to pray a prayer. You just repeat after me, and you give your life to the Lord right now, in Jesus' name. Here we go. Dear Father God, I ask you to forgive me of all my sins, and to ask you, Jesus, come into my life, come into my heart. Be my Lord and my Savior. Baptize me, Lord, in your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. I'm, it just means the world to me that you guys tuned in and, and uh, listened to this message. Um, you know, God wants to be that canopy and that shield around you. And that's so important in our lives that we learn how to live in that bubble. God bless you guys. If you want to send some seed to us, we just really appreciate anything you can send us from afar. Uh, it just helps us get this message out there. And God is he's going to bless you and increase that. He's going to multiply it back to you. And uh, remember this, your ties always belong in your local church. I love you guys. I'm standing with you. Thanks for watching.